Starting off this countdown, we have the deadly accident. Disney has made the illusion that no deaths or accidents ever happen at their parks. That's a big lie. With thousands of guests coming and going every day, something is bound to happen. And Disney will go to extreme measures to make sure that word doesn't get out about it. One example would be Javier Cruz. In February of 2004, Javier Cruz, a worker at Disney, got dressed up as Pluto and headed out to join the parade. However, the foot of his costume got stuck and the float behind him didn't stop. It ran over him and he died. He had been working there for about nine years. This was such a tragic accident, but it didn't make news like it should have. Moving on at number 9, we have the unsanitary conditions. So back in the day, cast members at Walt Disney had to obviously share costumes, but they also had to share undergarments. Yeah, up until 2001, each costume had their own Disney sanctioned undergarments that they would all have to share. That is so gross. But because of this, a lot of workers were passing around scabies and pubic lice to each other. That is highly, highly unsanitary. I'm just glad that that's not a thing anymore. They ain't gotta share that stuff. Moving on at number eight, we have the sexism. Disney has a very sexist past. So a letter from Disney from back in 1938 showed that they wouldn't hire women to work for them. So the letter was addressed to a woman called Mary Ford who applied for a position on the animation team. In the letter, Disney said, and I quote, women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen, as that task is performed entirely entirely by young men. For this reason, girls are not considered for the training school. At the time, women were being discriminated against in many ways, but many people were shocked and angered by this letter. Coming in at number 7, we have the Cursed Ride. Due to its dark history, Disney park workers and others believe that the Matterhorn Ride is cursed. First off, this ride is responsible for the most fatal and non-fatal incidents. In 1964, a teen on the ride stood up in the bobsled and died after being thrown out from it. Then at another time, the ride caught on fire, injuring a family in their sled. And another visitor died after she was launched out of her seat and hit by another bobsled. You'd think they would have fixed the ride after the first couple of deaths. But no, they blame it on a curse instead. They should look into the safety of that ride. Clearly, it's not safe. And again, all those deaths happened at the park and still not a lot of people were talking about it. In our sixth spot, we have the deadly fireworks. Back in 2015, a Disney worker died after attempting to launch a firework off of his head. Devin Staples was a 22-year-old Disney employee. He was best known for dressing up as Gaston, but he would also dress up as multiple other characters. Upon lighting the firework, he died instantly. His brother said that there was no rushing him to the hospital. After the firework went off, he claims that there was no Devon left. Now, some say that this was actually an accident. He never really planned to light the firework, he was only teasing about it. Either way, this is so sad and tragic. But obviously, Disney doesn't want anyone to know that one of their workers died on their property while on shift. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Snow White. In 1937, Disney came out with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which is the first and oldest feature length animated film released by them. Now, you would think that voicing Snow White would be the role of a lifetime, but no, think again. Adriana Casalotti, who voiced Snow White, actually had her career ruined by Disney. So Disney made sure that besides Snow White, she was never credited for any other work that she was in, and she was banned from doing any other voice work. Why? Because they wanted to preserve the illusion of Snow White. She couldn't even do radio interviews. That's a little extreme, like Disney owned her voice. Moving on to number four, we have the Lemmings. In 1938, Disney came out with a nature documentary. In the documentary, there's a scene where a bunch of lemmings commit suicide by leaping into the ocean off of a cliff. And Disney claimed that that was normal and part of the animal's migration. They even had a clip in the movie showing the lemmings doing so. 
but this is entirely false. These animals don't just jump off cliffs in groups and kill themselves. So for this scene, Disney imported a bunch of lemmings and then pushed or threw them off of a cliff. That's not really a happy ever after ending for them, Disney. In our third spot, we have the ashes. So apparently it's a thing to take your loved ones to Disney World. Not your living loved ones, no, no, your dead loved ones. And then you sprinkle their ashes all over the park. Believe it or not, but this happens more often than you think. Visitors will bring their loved ones ashes on a ride and then release them down on Disney World. Um, what about the other people on the ride? Like all you need is a gust of wind to blow those ashes right into their face. Now there's one ride in particular that people love doing this on. Take a guess in the comments below. Done? Okay. It's the Haunted Mansion ride. I don't know what it is, but tons of people release their loved ones on this ride. And when that happens, Disney literally has a special vacuum that they use to suck up the remains. Like, they have a protocol in place for when people do this, cause it happens so often. That's so messed up. Maybe don't do that, cause your loved ones are just gonna end up in a vacuum and then in the trash. Moving on to number two, we have the alligator attacks. So once upon a time, Disney had a really bad alligator problem, but obviously they didn't want park guests to worry, so they kept downplaying the problem. From 2006 to 2015, 220 alligators had to be removed from Disney World. Then from 2015 to 2016, there was a massive increase of gators at the park. Since Disney is connected to waterways that intersect with lakes and rivers, alligators have an easier access to Disney than they admitted to. Sadly, in June of 2016, a young park guest was killed in an alligator attack. That's when Disney was exposed for downplaying the seriousness of their alligator problem. And in our number one spot, we have Debbie Stone. Debbie Stone was an 18 year old hostess at Disney. However, in 1974, she sadly lost her life while on the job. And her death remains a huge mystery. So Debbie was a hostess for America Sings, which was a musical performance at Disneyland. For this attraction, you would be seated in a theater facing a stage. And after each performance, the theater would would rotate. But sadly, during one performance, Debbie got caught between the rotating wall and the stationary stage wall. She was instantly crushed to death. She was found with her body in pieces. Her death was kept a secret, like all the other ones on the list. Disney didn't want the other workers to hear about it. And her friends working at Disney were not allowed to even make a memorial for her. But the mystery remains. How did Debbie end up between the walls? Was she pushed? Did she trip and fall? We don't know. Only Disney knows. Starting off this countdown, we have the Smellitizer. Disneyland sees about 18 million guests per year. Disney World sees about 58 million guests per year. That is an insane amount of people. Now, what if I told you that Disneyland mind controls its guests? I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. So Disney uses a device known as the Smellitizer. Basically, it's a device used to pump fumes throughout the park. For example, at the main entrance, they pump out the smell of popcorn to entice you to buy some. In candy shops or ice cream parlors, it will smell sweet like vanilla. They also do this to make their rides more immersive. Like at the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, it will smell like wet wood and sea salt. They are literally controlling what you smell. If that's not a form of mind control, then tell me what is. In our ninth spot, we have the monorail. So at Disney World in Florida, they have a public transit system known as the monorail. Basically, it allows guests to travel free between locations associated with Disney. However, in 2009, a 21-year-old monorail driver lost his life while on the job. He was transporting the last batch of guests for the night when another monorail came speeding towards him. They got into a head-on crash that took his life. After investigating the issue, it was discovered that the crash was entirely Disney's fault. They violated a number of safety protocols and even got fined for this. Coming in at number eight, we have the people mover. 
The People Mover ride was a transport attraction that opened up at Tomorrowland at Disneyland, California in 1967. Basically, you would board a small train that would take you on a ride above Tomorrowland from above. However, a month after the ride opened, a 16 year old boy tripped and fell onto the track. The oncoming train crushed him and dragged his body for a few hundred feet before stopping. That was just a month! after opening. But sadly, it's not the only accident that happened. In 1972, a teen fell 30 feet to the ground from the tracks. As a result, she broke her arm, hip, and pelvis. She ended up suing Disney. Then in 1980, another male was crushed and killed by this ride. Over the years, there have been tons of lawsuits from people who have gotten injured on this ride. In our seventh spot, we have the injuries. The Disney mascot actors go through a lot. And I mean a lot. Not only do they have to wear those heavy costumes in the heat, but they also have to deal with whiny children and a bunch of Karens. But what you may not know is that Disney mascots often get seriously injured while on duty. A woman playing Mickey Mouse suffered a bad neck injury after a guest kept patting her head, which caused the head to fall down and strain her neck. The costumes themselves weigh around 47 pounds. They are blamed for at least 282 injuries. Not only that, but they are often Often touched inappropriately by the guests. A lot of workers have filed police reports because guests would grope or touch them inappropriately. It's not the kids though, it's the adults. A Disney princess had a 51 year old man grab her breasts. He was arrested and then charged with battery. In another case, the actor portraying Donald Duck got grabbed inappropriately in certain areas by an older woman. Those poor mascots go through so much. Making our way down the list, number six, we have the Creepers. It's scary, but a park full of children attracts the wrong kind of people. Over the years, Disney has had a real problem with predators at the park. And I don't know what kind of background checks that Disney is doing on their employees, but obviously they aren't thorough enough. Because over the years, a number of park employees have been arrested after being inappropriate with the park guests. Since 2002, 42 employees have been arrested because of this. That's way too many people. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the freaky business. So apparently a lot of people like to get it on at Disney World. Author Leonard Kinsey highlights this in the book, The Dark Side of Disney. Basically, he describes the truth about Disney and exposes all their dirty little secrets. So apparently, a lot of people have s in the companion restroom. It's a single room with a toilet and sink for anyone that wants a little extra privacy or for anyone that wants to get a little spicy. Like really, come on guys, keep it together. Apparently, a lot of people try to get it on during rides as well. If you're caught though, you get the boot right away. You get the boot and no booty. <laughs> in our fourth spot, we have the chef soup. So in 2010 at Disneyland Paris, two chefs committed <laughs> Apparently the working conditions weren't the best. One of the chefs apparently became depressed after the food at the park switched from freshly made to frozen. His <laughs> note read and I quote, I don't want to work for Mickey anymore. This seems like an urban legend, but I swear I'm not making this up. The other chef apparently took his own life because of humiliating treatment at work. Then in 2013, another employee tried to take his own life by setting himself on fire. That's crazy. Coming in at number three, we have the deaths. So Disney claims that no one has ever died at their park. Clearly that's not true, like I just finished talking about all the people that have died at their parks. So it turns out what Disney does is when someone does die at the park, employees have to remove the dead body from the property before pronouncing them dead. That means no one technically died at the park only outside of the park's gates or wherever they were. They do this so that all the families feel safe coming there. I mean, the park must be super safe if no deaths have ever occurred there. Very sneaky, Disney, very sneaky. Moving on to number two, we have the workers' deaths. So that's not the only crazy rule that Disney has. They also have a rule as to what should happen if a mascot or a character actor gets injured or dies there. No matter what happens, they have to stay in character. Once they are out of the public's eye, that's when they can receive medical attention. For example, one worker was told before accepting a job as Water Goofy on a Disney cruise, he had to agree that in an event he started drowning, he had to be carried away before lifeguards remove his costume and perform CPR. So he could literally be dying in the costume and need medical attention right away, but Disney won't allow it. And in our number one spot, we have the cover up. 
This is by far one of the biggest cover ups made by Disney. So on December 24th, 1998, two park guests and an employee were involved in a bad accident on the sailing ship Columbia Ride. A heavy metal cleat became loose and hit the guests and employee. One of the guests died and his wife was hospitalized. But Disney failed to notify the police. When they were called to the scene, Disney cleaned up the mess as quickly as possible before the police arrived. They also refused to let in outside medical personnel. They were afraid that this would frighten the park guests. Two things they shouldn't have done. They got a hefty fine as a result of this and were taken to court. So starting us off, in at number 10, there may be real skeletons in the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction at Disneyland. This is one of my favorite rides, and next time I ride this, I'm gonna jump off the boat into the water and I'm gonna go looking for this. Apparently when they were deciding to build the ride, the Imaginers decided that the prop skeletons, well, they didn't look real enough. So they hit up the UCLA Medical Center for some actual skeletons to be featured. I mean, this just took a whole new level. Throughout the years, most of these have been replaced with replicas and given a proper burial, but apparently there are still some real bones, if not entire skeletons, guarding the treasures. Next up, number nine, there are no modern bathrooms in Magic Kingdom's Liberty Square. Disney really went above and beyond to keep this authentic to its time period. Back in the colonial times, washrooms weren't used on how we use them today. So of course, Disney had to make sure to keep this continuity by making sure these are no modern washroom. Yeah, there technically are some in Liberty Tavern and Columbia Harbor House, but these are set so far back in restaurants that they aren't actually in the Liberty Square anymore. Magic Kingdom's main street doesn't actually have the American flags lining in it. Okay, so obviously it looks like it's lined with American flags, but Disney actually had to make some slight adjustments. They did this to get around a law that says that every flag has to be raised, lowered, and raised at half mast appropriately. In order to keep the flags flying high for the visitors, you know, all the time, Disney made sure to remove a star here and a stripe there, making the flags technically not American. Coming in at number seven, there's a labyrinth of secret tunnels underneath Disney World. This one has definitely become more well known recently, but it is still a pretty cool kept secret. In order for the cast and crew to get from point A to point B without walking through the park and you know risk being seen acting out their characters or having their characters be seen in a world that they don't exist in, well obviously these tunnels are closed off to the public, but apparently it's like a whole other world down there. The tunnels even have their own barber shops that specializes in Disney approved hairstyles. I don't know if that's real, but I want to go find out. <laughs> Filling in the number six spot today, there is an entirely private members club at Disney World, and it has four locations one in Epcot, one in American Adventure, the one in Magic Kingdom is beside the entrance to Adventureland, and the one in Hollywood Studios is on the second floor of the Hollywood Brown Derby restaurant, and the fourth is being built at Animal Kingdom. All four of these have a theme that go along with Walt Disney's life, but unless you're one of the you know lucky few, you probably won't have a chance to see inside, but you can be sure that they are swanky, fun, and impeccably decorated. In at number five, cats roam the ground of Disneyland at night. Apparently while doing a walkthrough of Sleeping Beauty's castle, Walt Disney and the Imaginers discovered it was filled with flea-written feral cats. They initially were going to adopt them out to cast members, but instead decided to keep them around to help, you know, keep out the mice. Well, except for Mickey and Minnie, of course, because that would be devastating. Next up, number four, the basketball court inside the Matterhorn. Okay, so this one isn't really a full court, but more of a hop, backboard, and floor marking. But still, you can play basketball inside of the Matterhorn at Disneyland. I don't exactly know why this was put there, especially since every detail of Disney seems to have a unique function, but oh well, it seems like it would be a fun place for Cinderella and Lilo to have a little 
little one on one during this break. All right, coming in number three, there are scents being pumped through the park. If you walk down Main Street and smell freshly baked cookies, or walk by Pirates of the Caribbean and smell seawater, you're not going crazy. The parks do this in order to enhance the experience of the visitors and make their trip to Disney even more immersive. Even the hotel lobbies have more of a home scent pumping through them to make the guests, you know, more comfortable. Number two, you can hear a secret conversation on Main Street. Inside the hat shop on Main Street, you can find an antique telephone. If you pick up this phone, instead of being able to make your own call, you'll be able to eavesdrop on a mother and a daughter's phone call in which they're arguing about the price of groceries. This one is not a huge underground secret, but it's definitely a cute little easter egg that can make your visits to the parks that much more fun and immersive. And finally, in at number one, there's an abandoned water park inside Disney World. Disney World's first water park ran for about 25 years until it closed down in 2001. For some reason, it was never torn down and it remains there today. It's on an island in the middle of Bay Lake in the park and although it obviously isn't accessible to the public, there are photos of it that shows moss and vines and other plant life taking over. I mean, a mysterious closure and Disney not wanting to disturb the remains of what was there. Well, that definitely has some major curse vibes to me. Starting off this countdown, we have Beauty and the Beast. Here's a film that surprisingly is based off of a real life story. Or so, that's what people believe. The story is of a real man named Petrus Gonzalves from 1537. He suffered from hypertrichosis, a condition that causes excessive hair growth all over a person's body. Due to his condition, he was captured as a child and treated like an animal or a beast. In fact, people locked him away in an iron cage and fed him animal food. And we all know that the beast in Beauty and the Beast was locked away in his tower and treated like a monster as well. So now, try looking at that movie the same. Moving on to number nine, we have The Jungle Book. Disney's movie The Jungle Book was actually based off of the book by Rudyard Kipling. But in the book, Mowgli literally turns into a wild killer. So long story short, he ends up killing Shere Khan and then discovers that his parents have been captured in a nearby village. So what does he do? He destroys the village and kills a bunch of villagers. Like where was that in the Disney version? Definitely would have made it way more interesting. In the end, he does find a safe haven in a different village, but still, this dude literally slaughtered a village. In our eighth spot today, we have Dumbo's father. Turns out that Dumbo is another Disney movie that's based off of a real story and a real elephant. Of course, you probably have realized by now that the true versions of these stories are downright dark. So in Dumbo, Dumbo's mom is Miss Jumbo, making Dumbo's dad Mr. Jumbo. Well, this is a reference to a real life famous elephant named Jumbo, a male African bush elephant who was treated terrible. He was tortured his whole life and then killed at a young age. You know how we don't see Dumbo's father in the film? Well, that's cause his father is dead. Like, Seriously, Disney, why'd you have to do that to us? Coming in at number seven, we have Snow White. In 1985, a German historian by the name of Eckhard Sander claimed he had proof that Snow White was based off of a real woman from the 16th century. Her name was Margaret von Waldeck, and she was a German countess. But when she was only 21, she was poisoned and passed away. Not only that, she was under the care of her stepmother who treated her poorly. At 16, she fell in love with the prince, but her stepmother greatly disproved. It's believed that her stepmother was the one who poisoned and killed her. The whole story of the seven dwarves was also real as well. Sander believes the dwarves were individuals with stunted growth as a result of working in the mines owned by her father. So there you have it. This Disney princess is based off of a real woman and her tragic life story. Moving on to number six, we have Cinderella. Cinderella is believed to have been based off of a story from the 17th century, but it may also have been based off of a Chinese fairy tale from 206 BC. This is the story of Yi Shen. Yi Shen was the daughter of a chief. Just like in the fairy tale, Yi's father tragically passed away and she was left in the care of her evil stepmother. She even had an evil stepsister that was very rude to her. Yi was then forced to constantly wait on her mother and stepsister. Of course, in the story, there was also a ball that Yi was not allowed to attend. 
but she makes a wish for a beautiful silk dress and golden slippers, and her wish comes true. She then attends the ball in this beautiful outfit, but is cautious. She doesn't want to be caught by her stepmother. In the end, she ends up fleeing the ball to avoid being spotted and loses one of her golden slippers, just like Cinderella and her glass slippers. The king becomes obsessed with trying to find out who the shoe's owner is. You get it, yeah, 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 yeah. The slipper fits and they live happily ever after. But there's also another version of the story that's much darker. And this is from the book written by the Brothers Grimm. So in the original book, when the prince arrives at Cinderella's house with the glass slipper, the sister's feet don't fit, right? So what do they do? Well, one of the sisters cuts off her toe and the other one cuts off her heel to try and make the slipper fit. Obviously that didn't work out for them. Then in the end, they get their eyes pecked out by a bunch of birds. So it's definitely not Disney friendly. Try to keep your mind off of that next time you watch Cinderella. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with The Shining. The movie Coco makes a number of disturbing references to the movie The Shining, which seems weird because one is a child's movie and the other is clearly not. So in one scene in the movie, we see Dante the dog wake up from a nap. In the background, we see an ax stuck into a tree. We didn't think much of it, but the director said that that ax was modeled after one of the axes from The Shining. You know, here's Johnny. <laughs> That's not the only reference though. In the same shot, right behind the axe, there is a red drum. The director said this was a reference to Red Rob from The Shining, which then we know is murder backwards. So it's just creepy, okay? In our fourth spot today, we have The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I swear, this movie is based off of one of the darkest stories. So it was based off of the story by Victor Hugo. In this story, things get messy and Quasimodo fails to save Esmeralda, who is being hunted by authorities. In fact, he kind of hands them over to them by accident. And then it gets dark and he watches her get hung. In the end, he is so distraught that he goes to her grave and stays there until he starves himself to death. That's not all though. Years later, someone goes to open her grave and they find Quasimodo's bones laying next to hers. When they try to separate the bones, turn into dust. The end. Kind of glad that the Disney movie didn't end like that, but it would kind of make for a good scary movie. Coming in at number three, we have Wally. -E. This one is, uh, it's an interesting one to say the least, but there's a theory going around that the humans and Wally -E ended up eating each other while on the spaceship. Yeah, you heard me. Let me explain. So in one of the scenes, it reveals to the audience that the humans were on that spaceship for longer than they had anticipated. They were only supposed to be there for about five years, but it ended up being there for around 700 years. Okay, so how would they manage to have a food supply on board for that long? There's no way they could have. Here's another question. When someone dies on board, where's the body going? Well, theory goes that they take the body, grind it up, and make food out of it. Those drinks we see people slurping? Yeah, it's liquid human. What makes it worse is that everyone on board the ship seems to be plump and well-fed, meaning they enjoy eating each other. That is, if they even are aware that that's what they're doing. Moving on to number two, we have Scar's corpse. Disney is sick for adding this into their film. So Scar's dead body can be seen in the movie Hercules. In the film, there's a scene where Hercules is wearing a lion on his body while he is getting painted. He then takes it off and throws it on the floor, and you can clearly tell that it's Scar. So after the Lion King, Scar was skinned and then given to Hercules. How dark. And this was actually confirmed by Disney's lead animator. Andreas Deja worked on animating both Hercules in Hercules and Scar in The Lion King, so they threw this in as a little Easter egg. But it's not a cute or funny Easter egg. No, it's pretty dark and messed up. And in our number one spot today, we have Pocahontas. The true story of Pocahontas is an extremely dark and messed up one. It is nothing like the movie Disney made it out to be. So the movie was inspired by a true story of a young girl named Matoaka. Pocahontas was just a nickname given to her and it actually means little brat or the naughty one. So there's that. But anyways, in the film, Pocahontas is a young adult. In real life, she was only 10 years old. But don't worry though, she didn't actually have a relationship with John Smith, thankfully. In fact, in real life, John Smith was said to be a very unattractive and rude individual. Anyways, continuing on, Matawaka actually did save his life by telling her tribe to spare him right before he was about to get executed. 
That's pretty much as far as their relationship went. But Matawaka did not have the best life. In 1612, she was kidnapped, taken advantage of, and then forced to become Christian. They even changed her name to Rebecca. She then was forced to marry a man named John Wolfe, and she had to move to England with him. Sadly, she passed away a year later at only 20 years old. Some say she became ill with smallpox or tuberculosis and died, whereas other people believe that she was murdered for looking different. She passed away without ever seeing her family again. Isn't that a messed up story to base a child's movie off of? I think so. Starting off this countdown, we have Scar's corpse. The Lion King's character Scar can be seen in Hercules, but he's not alive. No, they show his dead body, which is pretty dark, Disney. Sheesh. So in Hercules, there's a scene where Hercules is wearing a lion on his body while he's getting painted. He then takes it off and throws it on the floor, and we can clearly tell that it's the body of Scar. So after the Lion King, Scar was skinned and then given to Hercules. How dark. And this was actually confirmed by Disney's lead animator. Andreas Deja worked on animating both Hercules and Hercules and Scar in The Lion King. So they threw this in as a little Easter egg. In our ninth spot, we have The Shining. And if you guys are liking this video so far, why don't you hit that thumbs up button? Cause it really helps us out and I appreciate it. Stephen King's The Shining was referenced an awful lot all throughout Toy Story, which is super whack because we all know that The Shining is not a kid's movie and it's certainly not Disney friendly. First, let's take a look at the first Toy Story. Fans were quick to point out that the carpet in Sid's house looks exactly like the carpet in the hotel in The Shining. I mean, they are different shades, but it's the exact same design, which is also quite clever because then they're trying to use this to symbolize how terrified the toys feel inside of Sid's house by comparing it to how the characters felt living in the hotel in The Shining. Like 10 out of 10, that was super well done. But that's not all. There was another reference to The Shining, but this time in Toy Story 3. They use the number 237 a lot throughout this film. 237 is reference to room 237 in The Shining. This number can be seen on the license plate of a garbage truck, on a message Woody sent to a toy whose code name is Velocistar237, and on the side of a security camera in Sunnyside Daycare. In fact, one of the editors on the film admitted that these were all references to The Shining. I mean, it's kind of a weird movie to reference in a kid's film, but whatever. Moving on at number eight, we have Melted Olaf. Sadly, a lot of Disney characters don't have the happy ever after we thought they did. Next, let's take a look at Olaf from Frozen. He's such a fun and loving character, but sadly, he doesn't have the best ending. Sometime after Frozen, Olaf dies, he melts away, and his body can be seen in Moana. If you take a close look at the supplies Moana is carrying with her on her boat, you can see an oddly shaped carrot and a stick that looks like a hand. Looks exactly like Olaf's nose and hands. So Moana was using his nose as food and his arms as a possible fire starter for her mission. Well, that's dark. In our seventh spot, we have Finding Nemo, again. For this next Easter egg, let's take a look at the tearjerker of a movie, Brother Bear. For real, if this movie didn't make you cry, then you're a monster or your heart is made out of ice. Anyways, in one scene when the character is salmon fishing, we can see Nemo among the group of salmon that's about to be caught and eaten. First off, how the hell did Nemo, a tropical fish, get so far north? Like Marlin must be tired of looking for your ass. Anyways, what does this mean? Well, it means that Nemo, the little rascal, went out again and got lost somehow. And then he ended up as someone's meal. I doubt he made it out alive this time. Now it turns out that at this time, Disney and Pixar were feuding. So that might be why this creepy little cameo was put into the film. In our sixth spot, we have Skinned Sully. Now I love the movie Monsters Inc. So this one is pretty dark for all you fans out there. But Sully is dead. Yep, you heard me. He died sometime after Monsters Inc. was released. So in the film, Randall always mentions how bad humans are. At one point, he says that humans skin monsters and make toilet seat covers out of their fur. Sadly, this foreshadowed the fate of Sully. 
In a Toy Story short called Toy Story Toons Partysaurus Rex, there's a scene where we see a kid taking a bubble bath. And it just so happens that in the bathroom on the toilet seat is a fuzzy Sully seat cover. So Randall was right. Humans do skin the monsters and turn them into toilet seat covers. Poor Sully, he ended up being skinned alive. I wonder what happened to Mike then? We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Boo Went Crazy. This next Disney Easter egg is accompanied with a pretty dark and crazy theory, so buckle your seatbelts. In the movie Brave in the Witch's Workshop, we can see a wood carving of Sully. Why would that be there? First off, Brave takes place hundreds of years before Monsters, Inc. does. The witch and Sully didn't exist at the same time, but she drew him, meaning at some point in her life, she must have met him. Well, theory goes that this witch in Brave is Boo from Monsters, Inc. I know it seems wild right now, but just hear me out. So Monsters, Inc. takes place in the future when humans don't exist anymore. It's theorized that the monsters use the doors to go back in time to a child's house to then collect their energy. Meanwhile, in Brave, we see that the witch magically disappears when she goes through doorways. Hmm, just like the scarers from Monsters, Inc. do. So theory goes that Boo couldn't forget about Sully. She missed him so much that when she grew up, she figured out how to tell teleport through doors. She then teleports through these doors in an attempt to stumble across Sully again. It's just sad because she did not age well. And who's gonna tell her that Sully is a toilet seat cover? Not me. Coming in at number four, we have The Shining Part 2. Toy Story isn't the only Disney movie to reference The Shining. The movie Coco does it too. And this is because the guy that added The Shining Easter eggs in Toy Story also worked on Coco. So in one scene, we see Dante, the dog, waking up from a nap. In the background, we see an ax stuck in a tree. We all didn't think much about it. We probably just missed it too. But the director said that the ax was modeled after one of the axes from The Shining. That's not the only reference though. In that same shot, right behind the ax, there is a red drum. The director said that this was a reference to Red Rum from The Shining, which we learned is murder backwards. You thought that was it? Think again. The Grady twins from The Shining also make an appearance. Yeah, you know those creepy little twin girls in blue dresses? They're in Coco. As Coco runs through Frida Kahlo's Underworld Art Studio, we see a painting of the two twin girls. The director again confirmed this reference. It's so creepy. Yeah, let's put The Shining in a kid's movie, great. In our third spot, we have The Last Rex. Rex from Toy Story can be seen in the 2008 film Wally. In one scene, we see him in the back, among Wally's collection of human junk. Now, if you think about this, this Easter egg is actually very depressing. Rex is all alone in a world that has been completely destroyed. All of his friends are dead. He's alone, isolated, and unloved. And as we know from all the Toy Story movies, loneliness really gets to these sentient toys. Rex is probably so anxious and depressed now. Moving on to number two, we have Herbie Fully Drowned. Speaking of sentient things, our favorite car Herbie from Herbie Fully Loaded has died. This car has made a cameo in a number of Disney movies, but sadly, his time has come to an end. In Finding Dory, there's a scene where we see Herbie at the bottom of the ocean. He's badly decayed and covered in moss meaning he's been down there for quite some time. Now, I don't know if Lindsay Lohan pushed the car into the ocean or what, but we all know that cars and oceans or large bodies of water don't mix. So sadly, his time has come to an end. And in our number one spot, we have the three little pigs. Disney is sick for this next Easter egg. So for this one, let's jump back in time and take a look at Disney's animated short, The Three Little Pigs. In one scene, we see the pigs singing and dancing in one of their homes. But beside them, in the back, is a framed picture of sausages. As we all know, sausages are made out of pig. To make matters worse, the frame is labeled as father. So their father got turned into sausages and then eaten. In another scene, we see another framed piece of meat. This time, it's like a ham leg or something, and it's also labeled as father. So the three little pigs' father was killed, hacked up, and sold as different meat items. 
Like, that is so twisted and sick. In at the number 10 spot, we have good teenagers take off your clothes. And that was a phrase, Sid, in the popular movie, Aladdin. What? So in the scene, Aladdin and the magic carpet fly up to Jasmine's balcony, only to find Jasmine's tiger, Raja, was up there. You can hear a little subtle voice in the background that supposedly says, good teenagers take off your clothes. In order to hear this, you actually have to turn up your TV really loud. Disney released a statement saying, in the movie Aladdin, it doesn't actually say that. Who, what? What are you guys hearing? It actually says, come on, good kitty, take off and go. The rumor started in 1993 when Aladdin was released to VHS. And at the number nine spot, the word sex is spelled out in the Lion King movie. A four-year-old boy from New York actually spotted this image while he was watching the movie. So just around halfway through the movie, there was a cloud of dust that forms when Simba, Pumbaa, and Timon were gazing into the stars while on a cliff. If you actually watch carefully, the newly formed dust appears to spell out S-E-X. Of course, Disney had a rebuttal. And they said that the image actually spells S-F. X, and there's not that line on that E. It was inserted by the special effects group, so it's supposed to spell like special effects, abbreviated. Things are looking up into the number eight spot. Well, I'm talking about the minister's erection in The Little Mermaid. So during Ursula's wedding scene, you can notice something protruding from the minister's pelvic region. And it looks like someone is more excited about this wedding than Ursula. Although it does look like an erection, if you look at this scene from a different angle, it's the minister's knee, and it's just badly positioned. Okay, so in at number seven, it's, it's gonna have you question your eyesight. Because I'm talking about the movie poster of The Lion King. So back in 2002, The Lion King was re-released in theaters for limited time. And this is a popular movie poster from it. At first glance, the poster seems innocent, right? It has Simba on the cover. But if you look closely, it looks like a semi-naked girl wearing what appears to be a thong. This is either Disney being very clever, or we just have too many people in the world with dirty minds. But now I probably just ruined your guys' childhood because you're always gonna see that image, and I'm sorry. Okay, so the Little Mermaid makes a second appearance on this list, and they come into number six. I mean, this is... We're talking about the damn Little Mermaid here, and they're making this list twice. And that's because a penis appears to be on the front cover of the VHS movie. So on the cover of the VHS, it seems that one of the castle's tips resembles a penis. And because of this, the castle is often referred to as the phallic palace. And phallic is like another term for penis. It was reported that an angry artist tried to like sneak this image in there. And this is to get revenge because he was gonna get laid off. However, on the newly released version of the Little Mermaid, you don't see this image appear on the cover. Okay, so in at the number five spot, we have the naked person that appeared in The Rescuers. During this scene when Bernard and Bianca are riding around the city in a sardine tin, if you pay attention, you'll notice a naked woman through a window in the background. Disney actually made this subliminal message public, and they claim that she was put into the film during the post-production. On January 8th of 1999, Disney decided to recall 3.4 million copies of the 1977 animated movie. Well, if you thought things couldn't get any more shocking, well, uh, I'm sorry to say it does, and this next one comes in to number... We have more penis imagery, and this time in the Hercules. Dr. Hercules punches out the River Guardian monster. A horseshoe hits him right on the forehead, which causes him an awkward looking bump to grow out of his head. It eventually grew into a penis shape, including morphing his eyebrows into a set of testicles. Okay, this next image happens in Alice in Wonderland, and this comes into number three. So I think we can all clearly see what this rabbit hole looks like. And I'm not sure why Disney feels the need to insert all these sets actual innuendos in children's movies. Not only is this image seen in the film, a lot of people say that Alice in Wonderland has a lot of drug references such as cocaine, speed, LSD, nitrous oxide, crystal meth, MDMA, marijuana, mushrooms, opium, and nicotine. I'm not really sure what's happening in this movie, but I think Alice needs some help because that woman takes a whole lot of drugs. Okay, so Mickey Mouse makes an entrance into number two, and that's because he's caught holding a penis. This image is an internet favorite. Minnie's dress makes a subliminal penis shape in Mickey's hand, which confirms a lot of people's beliefs that Disney sexualizes their content and displays it for a vulnerable audience. Okay, so we've all made it to the moment you guys have all been waiting for. We're in at number one. But quickly, let's recap everything we've had. We've had the Little Mermaid and all the penises. We've heard Aladdin tell teenagers to take off their clothes. We've seen the sex words in clouds, a naked woman in the rescuers. Alice might be using a whole lot of drugs. But in at number one, things get a whole lot worse. 
And we're talking about the movie The Monsters Inc. That did really good in the movie theaters and was seen by a lot of people. So what are we talking about? Well, this graphic image, which was allegedly seen in the final scenes of The Monsters Inc., it depicts what appears to be a children's drawing of two people in a compromising position. This image has been circulated all over the internet and it's left people wondering if this image is real or if it's just a hoax. So I looked into it a little bit more and it actually turned out that this isn't the image used in the movie. Someone photoshopped this really well and was able to like spread this rumor. And that's the reason why it comes into this list in at number one, because it even fooled me. However, it was confirmed that animators working on the film created this image as a joke. So this was created by someone who worked on the movie. Disney just knows how to pick. <laughs>